uh, we were discussing about the different aspects of uh, motion estimation and uh, towards the end of the class we were discussing about uh, some of the matching measures in order to determine the motion vector. So, two of the measures which we had discussed they are the um, uh, mean square error okay, or finding out the minimum mean square error and the other criteria that we talked of was the minimum of mean absolute difference. Okay. So, MSC criterion and MAD criterion and we had also mentioned that there is a third uh, criterion which uh, one uses and that is the MPC which stands for the maximum pixel count. Now, this is actually a matching measure. Okay. And what we mean by maximum pixel count is that if we take uh, the image function as S n 1 n 2 k okay, uh, and in the reference frame we search in the space uh, where the displacement is assumed to be i j that is to say that is the dis displacement vector being i and j. We will be searching there at n 1 plus i n 2 plus j and k minus 1 okay, because k is the current frame and k minus 1 happens to be the reference frame. And uh, then in that case we can uh, decide that if this quantity that is s n 1 n 2 k minus s n 1 plus i n 2 plus i k minus 1. Okay. If the mod of this quantity is less than or equal to some threshold theta, okay, some pre-assigned threshold. So, theta is a threshold. Okay. So, if it is less than a particular threshold that means to say that uh, the pixel at n 1, n 2 for the frame k has matched well with the pixel at the, uh, the position n 1 plus i n 2 plus j at the reference frame k minus 1. So, in such case we can say that okay, as a I mean on a pixel to pixel basis as if to say that we have found a match. So, what we do is that we keep a count. Okay. So, we uh, keep a count at the position n 1 n 2. Okay. So, in count n 1, n 2 we just define a binary quantity and that binary quantity assumes a value of 1 if this uh, magnitude difference between uh, these two uh, quantities that is uh, for the current frame k and the, ref uh, and the reference frame k minus 1 if this is less than or equal to theta in that case we put the count value to be 1 otherwise we put the count value to be equal to 0. Okay. So, count is equal to 0 obviously means that there is no matching. Okay. The uh, pixel value here is far deviated with respect to the corresponding pixel value at, uh, at this position in the past frame. So, what we will typically look for is that if we assume a block again and assume that n 1, n 2 are the coordinates belonging to the block B. Okay. So, B is the block of pixels. Okay. B is the block of pixels and if we take n 1, n 2 belonging to B, in that case we can define a uh, matching criterion uh, based on this. That is to say, we say maximum pixel count or we call it as the MPC measure corresponding to the displacement i and j and that we define as the summation or in this case say double summation because we have to sum up over the n 1 where n 1 goes from 0 to capital N minus 1 and n 2 goes from 0 to capital N minus 1 the quantity count n 1 comma n 2. So, this means to say and uh, here 
this uh, measure we just uh, find out for all values of this n 1 and n 2, where n 1 and n 2 belongs to the block. So, that means to say that if we are taking an 8 by 8 block, in that case over all the 64 pixels, okay, we are going to add up this uh, count. Okay. So, what we should look for in order to uh, get the um, uh, motion vector, what should we look for? Earlier in the case of uh, MAD or MAC, we were looking for the minimum measure. Now, here what measure are we going to take? Maximum measure. So, in this case, we should go in for the argument of the maximum value of MPC okay, for the displacement IJ. So, just search over IJ okay, and whichever IJ combination that means to say that whichever vector uh, motion vector gives you the maximum value of the MPC, okay, that IJ vector you take as the displacement vector or the motion vector. So, we can say that the motion vector d 1 d 2 written as a d 1 d 2 transpose that will be given by the argument max of this quantity. So, otherwise this is a very simple measure, okay. but uh, no matter whether, okay, I mean one advantage that one can claim about the MPC is that this count is a binary quantity. So, it is uh, I mean just a hard thresholding and it is quite sensitive to this threshold. So, the question that uh, needs to be addressed is that how to pick up this threshold value because if the threshold value is not correctly picked up, then the matching measure could be uh, I mean then the matching measure should not be trusted. Okay. So, uh, and uh, otherwise it is a very simple measure just adding up, I mean all that we need is an adder and we do not require any multiplication. Of course, we did not require any multiplication for the MAD measure as well, okay, even for the MPC. Uh, now, uh, what uh, we are going to consider is that no matter whether we consider the MAD or the MPC or the uh, MAC measure, okay. one thing is very certain that corresponding to every search position, our computational complexity is of the order of n square, where n by n happens to be the block size. So, it is the n square happens to be the order of uh, computational complexity and if we have a search window defined as the plus minus w, we had seen yesterday that 2 w plus 1 by 2 w plus 1 multiplied by n square and that is a very big number. Even if we choose w to be a reasonably small quantity of w equal to 7 and we choose n to be the practical, uh, I mean what we take for all practical applications that is we take n is equal to 8, the number is quite high. So, naturally, I mean when we talk of estimating the motion in real time, okay, definitely I mean the full search block motion is going to have lot of computational complexity. So, we have only two options before us. One option is that we, we go in for a specially designed hardware, okay, that we use some, we, we design some hardware unit. Okay, which will compute these uh, um, uh, um, the motion vector. Okay, and there is enough of research that has gone into this, and uh, still some further researches are going on. And especially in today's VLSI uh, technology, okay, there are uh, several efficient. Uh, uh, architectures which have been developed in the FPGA or in the ASIC okay. and uh, literature have reported that many commercial products are also available. But uh, I mean other than the using the specialized hardware, okay, the other solution is 
to go in for a fast search methodology or a quick search methodology. Okay. So, that will be what uh, we are going to discuss in this lecture. So, in this lecture we are going to talk about the fast motion estimation technique okay. and why fast techniques are required that I have already explained. In fact, you yourself should have realized this by looking at the computational complexity that is involved in the usual full search block motion applications. In the case of fast motion estimation techniques, what we have to do is uh, to uh, um, I mean reduce the number of computations that we are going to do. Now, one point is very clear that in the case of the full search block motion, although the computation complexity is very high, but we are guaranteed to get the minimum solution. Okay. Unless we have gone very wrong in choosing the maximum window size, the search window size. Okay. If we say that W is 7 and we search within the range of plus minus 7, okay, but if the actual motion happens to be beyond plus minus 7 pixels, okay, then we are wrong. But otherwise, the full search block motion is guaranteed to give you the optimal solution. But in the case of fast techniques, okay, let me caution you that fast techniques will be computationally efficient, but it is not guaranteed to give you the minimum solution. Okay. You may have to feel satisfied with a kind of suboptimal solution, because it is not going to check or it is not going to compute the matching measure in all positions within a window. Okay. In this case, in the, uh, in the case of any matching measure here, which is the value of i j that we use for searching? The entire search window, if it is the full search block motion, we will search everywhere within the search window. But uh, in the case of fast search, we do not do that. We only search at some specific points and those specific points are to be very judiciously chosen. Okay. How to choose that specific points? For that algorithms are existing and we are going to talk about some very fundamental and popular algorithms that people have suggested. Now, the uh, motivation behind the fast motion estimation technique is that uh, one can go in for uh, a uh, the, uh, that as you go away from the actual minimum position. Okay, I mean to illustrate that, let us uh, take some search window. Okay, now supposing this is a search window and this is the center of the search window okay. and we have first placed the candidate block at the center of the search window and then we search at different positions okay, within this search window. So, that the candidate block will be placed in different positions over here and then we are going to find out the matching measure no matter whether we take MAC or MAD or MPC all these kind of criterions that we talked of. So, uh, the uh, heuristic that is applied for the fast motion es estimation technique is that as you go away from the actual minimum. Let us say that this being the search window and this being the center of the search window there is some position let us say over here okay, where the minimum actually happens. Minimum means that this is the true search. Okay, the minimum of absolute difference would lie at this position. Now, the heuristic says that okay, in this case at, at this point you are going to reach the minimum. Now, supposing you do not choose this point for your matching, then are you going to lose everything? No. If you are searching in the close vicinity of the point of minimum, you will be still finding some 
lower values. I mean if you search at these locations, okay, here you are going to find lower values as compared to maybe somewhere over here at these search positions where you are going to find higher values. Even here also you may find higher values of matching measures. At all other positions you are going to find, find higher values of matching measures. Here you are going to find the minimum, but close to this, close to the minimum you are going to find lower values. And as you go away from the point of minimum, okay, the assumption that people make is that the matching measure value, okay, if you are using the MAD or the MSC, it monotonically increases, which means to say that if this is the point of minimum, okay, then as you go away from the minimum, okay, it will monotonically increase, the measure will monotonically increase at both the sides. That means to say that whether you go here or here or up or down, okay, left or right or up or down, everywhere you are going to find an increase in the value and that is monotony. So, that once you are close to the point of minimum, you are going to find out quite low values. Okay. So, then the search strategy could be decided this way that okay, if you find, if you, if you do some, uh, uh, if you do the searching at some specific points and obtain some minimum out of those search positions, okay. take that minimum position okay, and then you refine your search space. Once you find that your tentative minimum is obtained somewhere over here, then you did not have to search over this entire range. You reduce your search range, perhaps you search in this position. Okay. If you then find that your uh, minimum happens to be here, you reduce your search range further until the time, until the point you can come to the specific point of minimum. Okay. So, at least it guarantees or at least it uh, tries to see that, okay, I mean in a few iterations you will be at least close to your point of minimum or at least very close to your point of minimum. Okay. But if you are not exactly at the point of minimum, you cannot call it as an optimal algorithm. But if you are close to your point of minimum, you can at least call it as a suboptimal uh, uh, search technique. Now, there is no direct mathematical proof which people can give to this. I mean, if you ask me that is there a mathematical proof that this is going to happen, that it is going to be monotonically increasing as we go away from the point of minimum. Yes, the answer is no, because you never know that how the image is going to be and not the image. Here there is involvement of two images, the candidate image and also you have the reference image. So, unless you know the nature or the intensity values of this, you cannot really guarantee that this will happen, but it is seen, it has been observed that it happens. And intuitively we can still feel that why it should happen, because once we are at the minimum, definitely the intensity values very properly match. So, we are going to have a minimum value of the MAD or minimum value of the MSC. And if we are very close, okay, the intensity values have not changed drastically. Again, this is expected uh, from the smoothness criterion of the images, that the intensities in all natural image that follows a smooth function. Okay. So, the only place where we can expect a uh, deviation from this heuristical approach is where you have very sharp discontinuities in the image intensities. Yes, when you have discontinuities, then this heuristic may not hold good. Okay. 
Anyway, so uh, with the basic assumption that for most of the images this heuristic would hold good, okay, some efficient search techniques, suboptimal search techniques or quick search techniques can be described. And one of that is what has been described by Jain and Jain. And Jain and Jain's uh, technique is referred to as 2D logarithmic search, 2D logarithmic search. In the case of 2D logarithmic search, what is done is that we assume a search range, some, in, uh, some uh, maximum search range is assumed. Let us say that the search range is P, okay. so the initial search range is P and let us say that P is equal to 8. Okay. 8 means that it could be 8 on this side, 8 on this side, 8 on this side and 8 on this side. Now, in order to search for the motion vector, quick make a quick search of the motion vector. Supposing this is the center of the search window, center of the search window means where our candidate block is actually located, the coordinate position at which the candidate block is located, that is the center of the search position. And if we say P is equal to 8, in that case, at the positions P by 2 away from the center of the search, okay. in this case P by 2 is going to be 4. So, we go left by 4 positions, 1, 2, 3, 4. So, at this position again 1, 2, 3, 4, at this position this one and at this position. So, there are how many positions I marked? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5 because the center is also considered. So, we search only at this 5 positions not anywhere else in the first step of searching. So, search window to p is equal to 8 obviously means that we are going to have 2 into 8 plus 1, 2 into 8 plus 1 that means to say that 17 by 17 as our search window size in the full search block motion case 289, 17 into 17 means 200. 89, but instead of 289, we are searching only in 5 positions. Now, okay, let us search in these 5 positions. Let us assume that we have a an MAD as the matching measure. So, out of these 5 positions, you find out that which one gives the minimum. Supposing the minimum is obtained at this position. I encircle this. Okay. This is the first minimum position that has been obtained. Now, what happens is that we carry out our search further by taking this newly obtained minimum as the reference. Again, we consider the step size of p by 2. Okay. So, just like the way we did it earlier, we take it as 2, 3, 4. So, this position 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this position 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this position. So, we are going to again search in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 position, this 5 positions. Of course, out of the 5 positions, here we do not require any fresh computation because earlier itself in the first place itself, I marked them as 1. So, in the first uh, iteration itself, I have already picked up this one and this one. And in the second iteration, we have to look for this 3 new, but anyway in order to compare that which out of this 5 is a minimum, we compare between these 5 values and we have to obtain a minimum. Now, if the minimum happens to be the second iteration minimum happens to be the to be this one, in that case 
we will continue our search further. But if out of these five positions the minimum happens to be again at the center, okay. look at this uh, thing that if the second minimum, if the second iteration minimum again happens to be the center of this uh, newly defined search window, then what we do is that we reduce the step size further by a factor of 2. So, we make p as p by 2. So, p by 2 then becomes new p. So, that means to say that our search step size instead of being uh, uh, 4 over here, we make it as 2. So, which means to say that if this is the second minimum position. if this is the second minimum position, then for the third search, we will be using this one, this one, this one and this one. So, we mark them with a number 3 written on each side. So, all the all these four positions written with number 3 in the, on the side, okay, these are the pixels which are to be these are the positions at which we need to compute the MAD matching measure. Okay. So, these four positions plus the center one's value out of this five, we decide whichever is the minimum. Okay. If the minimum happens to be something other than the center, we continue this search taking the same old value of P. But if the minimum happens to be the center, every time the minimum happens to be the center, we reduce p by a factor of 2, which means to say that if for the third iteration also, this is the position of the minimum, in that case my step size gets halved further, okay. which means to say that in that case my step size becomes equal to p by 2 becomes equal to 1. Okay. So, then in the fourth iteration I must search this one, this one, this one, this one. But according to this 2D logarithmic search algorithm, when uh, p by 2 becomes equal to 1, okay, when p by 2 becomes equal to 1, that means to say that the search step size reduces to 1, in that case all 9 positions are searched, all 9 positions, all 9 neighborhood positions are searched. What I mean by that is that if p by 2 happens to be 1 as is happening in this case. Okay. So, there it is considered p by 2 is equal to 1 means there cannot be any further iteration of search. Right? This is the last iteration of search because you cannot make p as a fraction because the step size is uh, uh, has to be an integer. So, you are searching within this 9 positions in the fourth iteration and out of this 9 whichever gives you the minimum that is what you declare as the final minimum. So, if the final minimum happens to be this one then this is the final. So, in that case the motion vector will be given as the coordinate position of this with respect to this or the displaced coordinate position between this one and this one. Okay. That will be the final motion vector okay, would be decided accordingly. Now, why it is 2D? Simple, the search space is two dimensional and why it is logarithmic? Because the step size is logarithmically reduced. Okay. We a, at every step, at every iteration we are reducing the step size by a factor of 2 and that is why it is known as logarithmic search. Now, look at the beauty of this logarithmic search technique. If this is the center of the position, we search at the end of a plus. Okay. If this is the center of the search, then we uh, search at the end of a plus sign okay 
where the length of the plus sign will be decided by what value of p we have. Only at the last step, okay, we are searching all the nine, all the nine neighbors. Okay, so there, we are not only searching the plus, but also searching the cross neighbors, plus neighbors as well as the cross neighbors. All are searched, okay, only in the last step. Now there is a variant of this algorithm. In fact, there are several variants of this fast search techniques which have been proposed in the past and that is uh, and, and um, uh, of that I can tell you about one other technique which is known as the cross search. Okay. Now as the name suggests, okay, cross search means that instead of searching around a plus, okay, you search around the cross, okay, which means to say that if this is the center position, okay, you have some value of p okay, and then, then you go by steps p by 2 on either side in the cross direction. That means to say here 1 step, 2 step, 3 step, 4 steps. Let us say that p by 2 is equal to 4. Okay. So, you search over here 1, 2, 3, 4, you search over here 1, 2, 3, 4 here and you search here. So, here also you have got 5 different positions at which you are going to search and a very similar algorithm is employed. Okay. Now, the only uh, now th there are two major modifications which have been done in the cross search algorithm with respect to Jain and Jain. Okay. Of course, uh, changing from the ends of a plus to end of a cross is not a very big change, of course, I mean, because I mean, depends how one uh, defines the neighbors. Okay. But uh, one uh, important aspect which have been added in the cross search algorithm is just uh, an application of a thresholding to see that if you add, uh, I mean before beginning the search at all, you find that at the 0, 0 position, 0, 0 position means that at the candidate block position, if you compare the uh, sum of absolute difference measures okay, of the candidate block position with that of the, um, uh, the candidate block position with uh, that of the re reference block at the 0, 0 position at the same at the ca candidate block position. That means to say that there is no movement. So, if it happens that the difference in the sum of absolute difference values okay, at this position okay, in the frame k and the frame k plus 1, okay, they happen to be less than a predefined threshold. In that case, you need not have to search any further. You can declare that this block is a non-moving block. So, and uh, why it is being done is in the case of background or in the case of many stationary objects, okay, it is quite often observed that one does not have any significant motion okay, in, the, uh, in, in, in those regions. So, if there is no significant motion, then why to use a technique where after applying 3 iterations or after applying 4 iterations, you finally conclude that no the best position is 0, 0. That means to say the, the best motion vector is 0, 0. So, there is no change, no displacement. So, why to declare that after doing some computation? If that is the case, why not you declare it early? Okay. So, this is exactly what is being done in the cross search. So, what we do as the step 1 of the algorithm is that in the step 1, we calculate the sum of absolute difference measure okay, 
for the frame k okay, at the position 0 0 okay, and then we also find out that what was the sum of absolute difference value by taking k minus 1 as the candidate okay, at the same 0 0 position and if the difference in mode of these two values happen to be less than a threshold. Okay. So, T is a predefined threshold. So, T is a predefined threshold and if this value happens to be less than T, then the block is non-moving. Then the uh, candidate block is, is a stationary block. So, if it is a stationary block, you can terminate the search at the step 1 itself, you need not have to go further. But if you find that it is not the case, that means to say that it is a moving block, only then you go in for the motion estimation. And in the case of motion estimation, the approach is taken very similarly, that means to say that you search at the ends of the cross instead of searching at the end of a plus, you search at the end of a cross and then you uh, find out that if it happens to be the center, then you reduce the search uh, step size by a factor of 2. Okay. And then this algorithm, I mean at the last stage, I mean uh, when uh, p becomes equal to 1, it does not go in for a 9 point search but instead it uh, takes up that you either go in for the end of a cross or you go in for end of a plus okay, depending upon whichever is the minimum. Now, I am not uh, going into the details of that algorithm because uh, I mean very simply it is uh, not possible to exactly cover all the fast search techniques. Okay. There are many uh, literature references which are available for this. Okay, the idea is only to introduce you to different uh, such uh, efficient search strategy algorithms. Now, there is yet another very popular fast search approach which people have worked out and that is the three step search algorithm. Three step search algorithm and in three step search is very popular and it is in short form it is referred to as the TSS algorithm. Okay. Now, in the case of TSS one can say that it is a combination of the uh, cross search and the 2 D logarithmic search. 2 D logarithmic search at the end of a plus and cross search is the end of a cross. And in this case, in the in the case of three step search algorithm, okay, the searching is actually done in all the nine positions. Okay. So, there what you do is that you define some initial value of p all right, and then at the position. So, then you search at nine positions and what are those nine positions? Okay those nine positions would happen to be okay, minus p minus p, okay, assuming that the total, total search range in this case is going to be 2 p plus 1 of course. So, the nine positions are minus p minus p, 0 minus p, p minus p, okay, minus p 0, 0 0, p 0 minus p p 0 p and p p. These are the 9 coordinate position 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now, okay, I mean just pictorially will be better. Okay. If this is your 0, 0 position and let us say p is equal to 4. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is minus 4, 0 or minus p 0. So, this is one search position 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is p 0 
Okay. We have all these things. So, we have shown minus p 0, we have shown p 0. Then what we have to show? The end of a uh, plus if we say. So, then it is 0 uh, minus p and this is 2, 3, 4. So, this is 0 plus p. If this is the plus direction and if this is the plus direction, that means to say that this way if we follow the convention, that means to say that going this way makes it positive and going this way makes it positive. In that case, this is p 0 and this is minus, uh, no, this is 0, uh, 0 p is this one, this is 0 minus p. So, 0 p and 0 minus p, they are also covered over here. And then we have 1, 2, 3, 4 positions from here, 1, 2, 3, 4 positions from here, 1, 2, 3, 4 over here, 1, 2, 3, 4 over here. So, totally we have including the center, we have got 3 here, 3 here, 3 here. So, 6, 9, 9 search positions. So, then we search at all the 9 positions okay, and determine that which is the minimum value. Okay. And at the minimum value position, okay, let us say that this is the minimum value. In that case, you need not have to wait for the reduction of the search space. I mean just you find one minimum and then you reduce p by a factor of 2. So, as soon as you find any minimum, you make the new p as p by 2. And there what you do is that now your search space now becomes with 2. So, in the second iteration you search, I use a different pen here, 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 here and here. Again 9 positions and of course, the center is also included. And now let us say that we have found the minimum at this position. So, now we once again make p divided by 2. So, which means to say that p is already 2. So, 2 divided by 2 makes it 1. So, with this as the minimum position, we will be searching 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 at these 9 positions. And out of these 9 positions, whichever gives us the minimum value, if this happens to be the minimum value. So, this will be our final uh, position. Now, in this case, the uh, in the example I took p is equal to 4 and that leads to a search space of uh, 2 p plus 1, that is to say 9 by 9, okay. reasonably ok search position. Okay. And in this case, the number of steps that you perform is clearly 3. Of course, I mean uh, the um, um, uh, people who originally proposed this algorithm, they had named it as a 3 step search position, but of course, if you think it in a very general way, you need not have to call it as a 3 step search. You can call it as yet another form of a logarithmic search, because if instead of p is equal to 4, you assume p is equal to 16, let us say. In that case, it becomes a 5 step search, because p is equal to 16 means you will require 5 steps to bring down to p is equal to 1. So, your algorithm stops only when p is equal to 1 and you search all the 9 positions. Okay. That will be the last part of your search. So, uh, I mean uh, some of the techniques, so just to summarize, some of the fast search techniques that we have reviewed today are the 2D logarithmic search. Okay. We have talked of the cross search. We have talked about the three step search. And if you are keen to explore the literature, you will be finding that there are many different variants of these uh, techniques and some of the other techniques that I can just briefly make a mention is uh, an algorithm called new three step search. Okay. 
which is an efficient form of three step search called as NTSS. Okay. And then the diamond search algorithm, okay. and then uh, gradient descent search, block based gradient descent search. These are some of the techniques that one would find in the literature. In fact, the reason why so much of research has gone in the past several years is that motion estimation happens to be the most uh, time consuming block okay, in the video codec architecture. So, the critical path actually lies there and that is why I mean uh, the uh, research community is so keen to develop efficient search strategy okay, in order to reduce the search time. And again, uh, the algorithm should be such that it reduces the hardware complexity. The algorithm should uh, reduce the computational burden. So, with all these trade-offs in mind, okay, many efficient search techniques were developed. And all these search techniques, all these uh, fast motion estimation algorithms and everything okay, have gone into the various forms of the video codecs that have come into the market so far and some of which are still coming. Now, uh, before I uh, uh, conclude the um, uh, lectures on the video coding, okay, I should also make a brief mention about the different video coding standards that have been designed till date. Okay. So, I mean just like the way whenever we are transmitting the still images, okay, we have the standard JPEG and the improved version of standard is the JPEG 2000 as we already mentioned. For the video coding actually, there are several standards which have been proposed till date. Okay. In fact, when we talk about video, okay, the, there are two kind of perception which people have. One community who feels that okay, video would mean that it is only the continuous sequence of images. But there is also another kind of perception where they say that okay, not only images, not only the sequence of the images, but also the accompanying audio part. Whenever you are uh, filming something, even when you are using your handy cam, okay, your own camera, your own movie camera when you are handling. So, there you are interested in both audio and the video parts together. Okay. So, in that case, it is a combination of more than one media streams. One media stream is the video and the other media stream is the audio. Okay. And uh, this leads to multimedia streams, okay. Mul a combination of multimedia uh, bit streams. So, video coding standards also resulted in the development of the multimedia coding standards. Okay. Although the difference is, uh, I mean, is quite narrowed down, but there are two major communities in the world okay, who had looked into this video coding standards and multimedia coding standards. As far as the multimedia coding standards are concerned, okay, the research community basically looked into the uh, standards which uh, uh, are referred to as the MPEG standards. The full form of MPEG as most of you will be knowing is the Motion Pictures Experts Group. Okay. So, MPEG was the body who had formulated the multimedia coding standards. So, when they said multimedia coding standards, naturally it is not the video alone, but video along with audio 
that is what they had to cater for in their standard. Okay. And even the aspects like the synchronization between the audio and the video and all these things. Now, in the uh, now uh, the first MPEG committee was formed way back in the year 1988. Okay, and over the past 18 years, lot many MPEG standards have been proposed. Okay, and in the MPEG, actually the first version, the first of these MPEG standards was the MPEG-1. Okay, that was the very first standard. And MPEG-1 basically addressed the question of storing the videos okay, into the CD. So, it looked into CD compatible audio and video storage, okay. CD compatible audio and video storage, okay. And there the target bitrate that was specified was 1.5 megabits per second. So, this was the first of the multimedia standards. Okay. And then the second standard that came into the market uh, that, that, uh, uh, that was uh, I mean upgraded, the second upgrading was done as the MPEG-2. Okay. So, that was the next MPEG standard, but MPEG-2's charter was quite different. M MPEG-2 actually uh, addressed not only the lower end of application, but also it addressed the very high end of applications like the HDTV, okay, the high definition television standards. Okay. So, HDTV requires a much wider bandwidth. So, that is why its bandwidth rate, uh, its bandwidth is specified as the range of 2 to 20 megabits per second. And not only that, MPEG-1 was mostly a st standard for storage, whereas MPEG-2, since it addressed the high, high definition television, it addressed the communication aspect also. So, this is also a, so this is the, uh, so this is, uh, so this also contained the communication standards for the multimedia. So, that was in the MPEG and called as MPEG-2. And uh, there was another group okay, called, as the international, uh, called as the International Telecommunication Union, ITU. Okay. In fact, ITU was formed out of the earlier uh, group, which was called as Consultative Committee of International Telephones and Telegraphs, CCITT. Okay. Now, few years back, CCITT was renamed as ITU, called as the International Telecommunication Union. And International Telecommunication Union, they came with different standards for video coding. Okay. They also had separate standards for the speech coding, audio coding and all these things. Okay everything and for video also they had come up with some standard. Now, in the video coding, their first standard in the list was the H.261. Okay. H.261 was the standard which addressed the video conferencing applications okay. and it is primarily an ISDN video conferencing application that is the H.261. 261. Okay. And here the target bitrate was, uh, it is called as the P by 64 kilobits per second. Okay. So, it is quite a low end of bitrate application. P is an integer okay. and if you take P is equal to 6, a very typical figure, you reach 384 kilobits per second. So, 384 kilobits per second for video conferencing was okay with the leased lines. When one used the leased lines, 384 kilobits per second was okay. Now, they also started the work for the next generation of the standard and this should have been H.262. But what happened that when 
the MPEG-2 work began, then it was found that more or less whatever H.262 wanted to address was also getting addressed by the MPEG-2 standard. So, there was no standard which was for, uh, formally drafted as H.262 and instead all the H.262 charter got into MPEG-2. Okay. And then uh, uh, there was also a thinking of having a standard called MPEG-3, but by then the ITU, they thought of the standard H.263. So then it is this group, the MPEG group who thought that it is better to give the ball now to the ITU. So, no MPEG-3 was there, but instead H.263 was adopted. Okay. Now, H.263 is for very low bit rate applications. So, it is very low bit rate video coding okay. and by very low bit rate, we mean bandwidth less than 64 kilobits per second. So, it is a highly challenging one. And then there was the next standard which is H.264. This is the most recent of the ITU standards okay. and H.264 is significantly, H.264 significantly outperforms the uh, earlier standards that is H.263 and in fact, this has got several features, several very nice features, okay, which I can tell you in the next class because I need not have to tell you about all the previous standards. Okay. But then in the MPEG community, okay, there was uh, another standard which was MPEG-4 okay. and MPEG-4 addressed the object oriented object oriented audio and video coding. So, basically in the MPEG-4 standard, every video stream and every audio stream or every part of part of a video or part of a ob, uh, audio, okay, they are referred to as the audio visual objects. So, it evolved the concept of audio visual objects in short form called as the AVO okay. and AVO basically uh, is the main key behind this MPEG-4 standard. Then there are further MPEG standards which uh, is getting proposed now. Okay. Now the work is on the MPEG-7. Okay, and on the MPEG-21, okay. of course, they address different aspects okay, for which we can make a brief mention little later, I mean in uh, any one of the subsequent lectures, I can make a mention about what MPEG-7 and 21 are going to do. So, okay, for today, we stop at this point and we are going to summarize our conclusion, discuss little bit about H.264 and summarize our lecture on the H. Uh, I mean on the video coding search. Thank you.